Okay, so let's take a minute and look at what the confidence interval looks like for the difference in means. Now, take a look at your confidence interval formula. Once again, it's the same thing we've been doing. Here's your statistic, your critical T value, and here is your standard error. Now, what I want you to notice here is we don't have a single value here. We're subtracting the two means, and remember, those are the two means from each of the samples, our critical T and then your standard error basically is going to be your standard deviation of your statistic. And remember here, if you notice, we are adding the two variances. It's very important that you do that and then you take the square root. Also make sure when you're dealing with a confidence interval because we have a test statistic T that we state the degrees of freedom. Now, in order to use your confidence interval, you're gonna do the same step, state, plan, do, conclude. The difference now is, don't get too excited, you're going to have to have two conditions for each of the three pieces. There's two simple random samples, and the samples have to be independent from two different populations. They both have to be approximately normal. So you can say both sample sizes are greater than 30 by the central limit theorem, or you're going to have to make sure that you have the graph that proves it. So you must draw that graph. Your normal probability plot must be linear, therefore it's approximately normal, or remember with your box and whisker plot that it's going to be symmetrical and there's no outlier. So be careful with that. This independence condition is different than your simple random sample. Your simple random sample independence condition is stating that both samples are independent. And with your independence condition, you're saying that the population is 10 times the sample size for both of them, not just for one of them. So be very careful with that. Now, when you're asked to do all of these different tests on your AP exam, they're not gonna tell you, you're gonna have to make the decision and you're gonna have to name the test. So how do we name the two sample tests? You'll name it two sample Z interval for means or two sample T interval for means. It is very unlikely that you'll ever do a two sample Z interval on the AP exam. It's always gonna be a T interval because sigma is most of the time unknown. So two sample, tell the reader that you're doing a T and then an interval. So be careful because that's different from a two sample Z test and a two sample T test. Okay, two sample, two sample Z test is when sigma is known t-test, sigma unknown, make sure you're including your degrees of freedom. So how do you know when to use an interval versus a test? Well, remember that we talked about if it's asking you to estimate the difference in means, estimate the difference in proportions, that's when you're going to use an interval. You're going to use a test when it says, is there a difference in the means or is one larger than the other? Now, I would highly suggest whenever you are doing these questions to use your calculator degrees of freedom. So since you have two samples here and your test statistic T, you both sample sizes might not necessarily be the same size. So remember previously when we found our degrees of freedom, we always took our n minus one in order to get our degrees of freedom. However, getting your degrees of freedom is a little bit more complicated whenever you have two samples. So there's two ways to doing this, okay? Number one, when you're doing confidence intervals, I would plug the information into your formula, but I would suggest making sure that you actually get the answer from your graphing calculator, and that's gonna make sure that you have the answer actually correct, because a lot of errors can happen as you type it in. So let's take a look at this example below. Here is a data table for the diameter of trees in Georgia. Let's use this data to see how we can create a two sample T interval. So here's our sample sizes, the mean for each sample size, and the standard deviation. Notice two different populations, north and south trees. Okay, so what you're gonna do, you're gonna go to stat, over to test, you're gonna scroll down to two sample T interval. Now, the reason we're using T is because here, we this is not a population standard deviation, it's that of the sample, okay? So you're just gonna plug in your information. You're gonna plug in your um, sample size, your X bar, standard deviation, and then with confidence intervals for means, you're never going to pull, you are only pulling with proportions 
significance tests, okay? Never for any confidence intervals will you pull. And notice right here, it's gonna give you your um, confidence interval for the average difference in diameters of trees, okay? So here, notice, it gives you a crazy degrees of freedom. This is the more accurate degrees of freedom based on a complicated calculation, but I would always use your calculator degrees of freedom. And when you do that and you find that here, state from calculator so we know where you got it from. Okay, the calculator is, like I said before, going to give you the most exact degrees of freedom. Use the calculator if possible, rather than the smaller of the two degrees of freedom from the sample size. So the conservative estimate is whenever you take the smaller of the sample size, minus one to give you the degrees of freedom. But notice right here, this gives you the more accurate one. Now, if you want to get the degrees of freedom for a two sample t-test, you're gonna do it the exact same way. Go to stat, over to test, and then notice here number four is your two sample t-test, okay? It's gonna, you're gonna type in your information, it will also give you your degrees of freedom. Let's take a look at an example. Below are the test grades for two different sections of the AP statistics on the same randomly picked chapter. Does it appear that one class does better in AP stats than the other? Do a complete hypothesis test at the 5% level. Now, what I want you to notice is these are two completely different classes. Since they're two different classes, it's two populations, therefore it's a two sample t-test and not a match pairs test. All right, so let's go through this. Now, if you'll notice, there's two different sample sizes. So we kind of already answered this question. What kind of test should be used? A z-test, one sample t, two sample t, or matched pairs. This case, we're using a two sample t-test because they're two separate classes that are completely independent of each other. And make sure you're including the fact that it's T. Why is it T? Okay, T is because we don't have the population standard deviation. And here's another hint. In order to do match pairs, the samples have to be the same size. Obviously, my first class has a much larger sample than my second class. All right, so let's carry out this test of significance. See what you can remember from our state plan do conclude. State is always what we're doing here. We're checking to see if one AP stat class did better on a randomly chosen chapter at the alpha is 0 0.05. Make sure you state the name of the test. Now here, conditions. Technically you have six of them because you have two samples. So make sure you're including the correct wording to show that you have multiple samples here. All right, so for this one, we are showing that it is a simple random sample of two randomly picked tests. Now, also, those two tests need to be independent of each other. Okay, so here, not just the simple random sample of two randomly picked tests, the samples are also independent. Okay, because we cannot use a two sample test if they're not. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at the next condition here. So the next condition is that we want independence, and there's independence between, we said that the simple random sample, two independent tests, and the fact that the population is more than 10 times the sample size for both of your samples. Now the next thing that we're gonna look at is whether or not both samples are approximately normally distributed. Since we have a sample size of 19 and 10, you either need to use a normal probability plot or a box and whisker plot, and you must make sure that you graph both of those. That's very important. Okay, make sure you show the graph. Here, it's not really necessarily approximately normal since we do in fact have some outliers. So you can either state that we're proceeding with caution and we're not sure that the answers are correct, or you can state that the T distribution is robust, so we're still proceeding. Now, what does the null and alternative look like? The null is always going to be assuming that the two classes are equal. So that's really important here. Here we're making sure that the mean of class one is the same as the mean of class two. Now the alternative here is a little bit tricky. Here we're stating that they're not equal to each other. 
Why are we stating? Because we just said we're checking to see if one class did better than the other. We're not actually sure. We didn't say class one is greater than class two. So this is why we're stating they're not equal to. Make sure you define what mu one and mu two are. That's really important to make sure you define what they are so we know in the end what we've compared. Let's see what our tests look like. The first part of your due portion is going to be making sure that you state all of your statistics. So if you notice here, we have our mean of sample one and sample two, standard deviation, and our sample size. Now, I would highly suggest doing this entire thing on your graphing calculator, showing your work for your formula, but getting the p-value, the test statistic t, and your degrees of freedom from your graphing calculator. So what you're going to do here is you're going to state, okay, you're going to either state that you got the degrees of freedom from the calculator, which is more exact, or you use the conservative degrees of freedom, which is going to be 10 minus 1 or 9. The next thing you're gonna do is write your probability statement. Please make sure that you don't forget to do this. This is one of the easiest things to forget to do. Now, the question is, how did we know to write x1 minus x2 is greater than zero? Remember, that always goes back to our alternative. Your alternative here was that mu1 is not equal to mu2. So it doesn't actually matter which direction you do. You can either do minus x2 is greater than zero, but then the other way is tricky because you're gonna to have to flip both of them. So I would just highly suggest subtracting kind of what's in here, not equal to zero, and just using this mu1 minus mu2 and making this a greater than sign. Okay, where did, and the zero just came from you subtracting them and getting the zero right here. Now, let's take a look at what your test statistic looks like. Your test statistic T, remember, this is always the mean from your sample, and in this case, we're subtracting the means from the sample. This is important to show we're doing mean one minus mean two. So notice I have 89, which is mean one, minus 82.3, which is mean two. Then this, remember, then we always subtract the mean of the population. We don't know the mean of the population, but remember our null looks like mu1 equals mu2. So when you subtract them, you end up with zero. So we're assuming there's no difference in the scores. And here's your test statistic T. All this information just plug into your formula, but I would highly suggest that you just use your graphing calculator. It'll give you your test statistic T and your p-value. Now, why did I do two times my p-value in this case? Well, because I don't know if test, if class one did better or did class two do better. So I'm actually checking both of them. It's two-sided, so I must multiply my p-value by two. And then just remember right here, this is your standard error from that formula that we talked about previously, and you wanna make sure that you're taking the variance of one plus the variance of the other, then taking the square root. All right, so what does the conclusion look like? Not too much different than what we've done before. So there's insufficient evidence to show that one class performed better than the other. Why? Here's your interpretation of your p-value. Notice this sentence. The probability of getting a difference in the sample means as extreme as ours is point. 318. Why? It's not statistically significant at the alpha's 0 0.05 level because P is greater than alpha. We therefore make sure you state that you're failing to reject the null at mu1 equals mu2. Now, make sure here's the difference, the probability of getting a difference. Okay, so we're not talking about true mean, true proportion, getting a true difference in the sample means. And then notice how this is in context. There's insufficient evidence to show that one class did better than the other. It doesn't matter what sentence that's in as long as it's in one sentence. All right, the next video we'll look at a confidence interval.